So uh, Cynthia Allen, going to talk a little bit about Bones for Life and where that work came from. I actually thought I had something that was going to show you in detail, but it looks like that's not going to technologically work the way I wanted it to. Uh, even though I tested it before and it worked, it's not wanting to work now. So let's start out by doing some movement together and let's actually stand up. So I'm gonna stand up a little bit here. You won't be able to see my whole body, but you'll be able to see enough. Change my angle of my camera. And even though what the action is, it's gonna be down in my feet, I'm not gonna show my feet because that's just, well, boring. Okay, so if you've never done any Bones for Life before, this will be new to you. If you have done it, you'll go, oh, yep, this is familiar. And we're going to look at this, the spread and butter movement that comes from Bones for Life in order to send vibration through the body because vibration is one of the primary ways that uh, the body signals to bone that it needs health. And to do this, we're going to do a, little a light little double tap with our heels. So they're just barely lifting. It's not, it's not a lifting the heel away up and landing real hard. It's a tap, 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 tap. And we also put a vocalization with it so that every time we bounce, we have a vocalization called pum, P-U-M, pum, 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 pum. And if you put your hand on your chest and say pum, 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 you kind of feel some vibration already just coming from the pum pum. But we want to get the vibration of the floor. So we're going to start to put that together by bouncing on heels and just join your voice and your rhythm with me uh, as you're ready. Pum pum, 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 pum pum. Um, um. Good. Just pause and wait for a moment. Now I should have said that if you had on heels or a really hard sole shoe, those needed to come off. And I'm sorry, I forgot to say that. Hopefully you did not bounce on heels and heels. Uh, you can do this in shoes. Although uh, if you have healthy feet, I think it's good to do it without shoes. Now we started to send vibration through, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that does in a moment, but it's important to think about the curves of the spine as we're sending vibration through. So if we're sending vibration through a spine, which is more arranged in this kind of format, where there's a rounding in the upper back, in the neck, and the tail is tucked under, and you can see how I'm kind of hinging and collapsing here in the chest, then this is not, going to allow the transmission of force to go through the body in a way that signals bone health all the way up and down the chain, okay? So we want to work with ways that we can work with alignment. Now, if you would bring your hands behind your neck and just feel the shape of your neck, feel the terrain of your neck, and then Go ahead and slide the little finger up to the base of the skull. There's usually a, a knot there, a bony structure there that you can kind of leverage against. And then slide your index finger to this knot or at the top of the, of the uh, bottom of the neck and the top of the thoracic. And that's usually the seventh cervical vertebra. And then just spread your fingers out between them and just feel the fingers feeling the curve. And your thumb will just rest lightly on the shoulder. Now you're going to bring your other hand to your chest. And first, the hand on the chest is just going to feel the breath. That's all. Just feel the breath. So you can feel that there's probably some arising there when you breathe in and some falling when you breathe out. It'll be less or more for people depending on the way that you breathe. But now, the next time as you breathe out, you want to take the hand on the chest as if it's a handle. So it's actually, I'll change my angle here. It's if it's a handle, you're going to actually use the hand on the chest to carry the structure of the ribs, the structure of the ribs a little bit back and up. They're going to angle up. And I'm aiming really kind of for the base of the skull so that it feels like 
the distance between my fingers increases. That the distance between my fingers increases. So you just play with that several times. And then the next time that you have it scooped back and up, you're gonna pause there, keep the pressure on the chest so that the neck is more aligned and breathe easily. And now we'll bounce some heels together again. Pum pum, 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 pum pum. Last one. And then bring your hands down. And just pause and feel and notice that there's something different in about how your head is sitting on your shoulders, your shoulders on your on your um, rib cage, on your torso, your pelvis on your feet. So that would be one of the curves that we would need to worry about. The other curve that we need to worry about or be to worry is not the right word really. The other curve that we should be aware of and tune into that's vulnerable is the lumbar curve, the lumbar curve. And so again, you could place a hand behind the back and just sort of feel for yourself What's the shape of that structure like right now? An image I'd like to use is if you were to have the top of the pelvic bowl cut, right, and it was filled with water, would water spill out the front? Would it spill out the back? And of course we can see that on me, it's gonna spill out the front a little bit. And so we're looking for ways in Bones for Life to do alignment that does not activate habitual muscular patterns. We would never do that kind of a tuck using the abdominals and then bouncing on it because that requires a lot of additional effort and we really want the organism to start to re reorganize the organism, reorganize yourself for something that does not have to be held in all the time. So we're gonna instead start to train the system on how pressure can go through the spine without a lot of extra muscular holding. And one way we could do that is we could put our thumbs at our belly button, our fingers right above the pubic bone, and uh, luckily or unluckily, I have a little something here I can grab, and I'm gonna pull up on it sort of like a handle. Now, if you don't have anything there, you're a very skinny person, you just sort of put your fingers in here, and you just lightly coax it up, lightly coax it up, and then, feel what happens in the curve. And you can see it on me, if you can't feel it on yourself, that oh yeah, that tilts her pelvis and she ends up with a little bit less of an incurve um, in her low back. So we're not looking to flatten curves, but we are looking to bring them into their anatomical uh, neutrality at least once in a while, right? We need the whole range of movement available in our neck and in our low back. It's not that we don't want available range, but in certain moments, and in particular, in standing still or standing, uh, at the moment you stand on one leg, you wanna have neutrality in those curves so that pressure that's as maximum when you're standing on one leg and walking will travel through in, in a way that calls to bone health everywhere. So the next time that's pulled up, you stay there with it pulled. Be sure you're breathing easy. Relax your shoulders a little bit. And again, we'll bounce on heels. Pum, 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 Last one. And then let that go and pause again for a moment and feel what's happening. And you could take a step around for two or three steps before you came back to sit down. As you're doing that, taking a few steps around, I'll just add a couple, say a couple things. So I didn't give a lot of cues for noticing first what your starting position was, and normally I would, and I, in a class, I would stop and ask people, what are they feeling in their feet? What are they feeling in those curves? And then we would compare the changes. But in a, a very quick internet-based class here today, there's a limit on what we can do. So 
I wanted to give you more an experience of the actual thing, thing that's one of the things that's really different about Bones for Life, which is this ability to learn to send pressure through your skeleton in a way in which it is um, allowing the bones to stack according to the anatomical design so that pressure goes through them evenly. Anytime there's a shear force so that the pressure does not go through evenly, they may not actually slip like that, but the, let's say this was two vertebra and the pressure's coming through at an angle instead of how it was designed to go up and down. There will be uneven development at this joint. There will be wear and tear at this joint. So we're wanting that to go up and down very easily. We call this the domino show effect. Ruthie Alon is the creator of the Bones for Life work. As you know, she's a 40, 50 year Feldenkrais practitioner now. She started out at a developing this work when she was in her 60s and she's 87 this year might be 88 now and um, she wanted to find a work that would allow people to take in sort of bite-sized pieces of somatic education in a way that they could really use it in their own life very quickly for bone health for joint health for strength I think of it now as uh, you know, moving gracefully for our grace-filled living. It's like, how can we be more comfortable, as Larry was talking about earlier, more comfortable in our bodies so that we can move more easily? So bones, this bouncing on heels is something that people can do very, very easily, very, very quickly at their sink, when they're brushing their teeth, when they're getting up in the morning, first out of bed. I have people who tell me that it's the first thing they do when they get out of their bed that have trouble with their feet and that it actually helps their feet. I have people tell me that they do it in choirs. Where they're standing for long periods of time, they bounce on heels in choirs to reinvigorate themselves. Uh, I have a veterinarian who tells me she does it during surgeries on concrete because she does all day long surgeries and that this is extremely hard on her body and she has a way to revitalize herself. And then there's all the people who are doing it for their bone health. So it's a way of engaging in weight bearing activity that can uh, truly bring about some, I think, vibratory bone health vibratory bone health and and when you add these pieces these simple pieces of people learning I say simple but it actually takes some time learning how to align their neck learning how to align their low back letting pressure travel up and down through it this really makes a big big difference so it's a um, it's a very, I think a very practical uh, I think it's a very practical work I think it's a very practical work is how I would uh, look at Bones for Life. I don't know, you may, may or may not know this, I was involved in a Bones for Life uh, research study. I was one of the principal researchers actually in that study. Carol Montgomery and I, uh, along with Sherry Farber and uh, Mark Farber, uh, did a study which was a pilot study that was published. And we had 25 subjects with ages. This is some of what I was going to show you on my slideshow that doesn't want to work right now. But 25 subjects, uh, 22 of them female between the ages of 62 and 89. And so the mean age was 73. And we had these people coming in for one time a week uh, for a 90-minute class for six weeks. So mean age, 73. They're community-dwelling um, so they they're, are active in their lives. They have a number of health issues. So as a lot of people who by the time they're 73, they, these were not people without some difficulties, some of which were pretty significant, now they're more like run-of-the-mill orthopedic items. They're only coming once a week for 90 minutes. And we had good results on the qualitative measures of the something called the SF36 Health Survey which looks at physical and mental domains. They registered, we got positive results out of eight domains. We got positive results in three, uh, vitality, the health perceptions, and mental health. So in that improvement of, vi of vitality, it was a significant finding with a 0.026 um, standard deviation. 
And that was, I'm sorry, a P factor of 0.026. I did not mean to say standard deviation, a P factor. And this really means that it's highly unlikely it was an accidental finding, that it would be very difficult to just have this kind of finding show up in some kind of random or accidental way. Um, and Ruthie Alon talks about this idea of biological optimism, which is how we would take this word vitality, that people felt this sense of biological optimism, like there was some, something, I call it this feeling like I can do this life. That's what I call it. This feeling like, hey, I can do this life, which any of us who have uh, felt physically or emotionally like we can't do this life which I mean is almost everybody at some point. You can remember when you could hardly see what the future held for you that Bones for Life brings about this feeling of biological optimism. I was just telling the story last week in a class about a woman who came to my weekly Bones for Life class. It's not this research project, but one of my classes, who was, had metastatic breast, breast cancer. And she... Um, came to our classes quite regularly in the last few months of, of her exploration. And she would come into class, and she didn't say it this way. She said it in a more crude way, but since we're on YouTube, or will be on YouTube, I'll say it this way. She would say, I would go home from every class, and I would just be so sexually alive, right? Sexually aroused. I was ready to have sex. So... That, to me, is a bi form of biological optimism. And, I, and I, we didn't know how serious she was, but when she died, we clearly knew how serious her situation was. And I thought, wow, you know, what a way to be able to engage in your life right up to pretty close to the end and feel that you were vital and, and you, you, had, you had what it takes to do this life, even though things were not going very well for her on a whole nother level. So I think this feeling of biological optimism allows people to get their most out of life. It's not a perfect life, right? But the most optimal uh, life they can have given their situation. Um, one of my colleagues in my gate work, Carol Montgomery, talks about the optimal gate, not the perfect gate, but the optimal gate for your particular situation. And I would say, that in the works that we're presenting tonight, NLP and Bones for Life, we're looking at not, we're not looking at perfection, we're looking at optimal given the situations that um, we have, which are uh, also real, uh, or at least real to a point. Sometimes they're not as real as we think. And this is what we find out in these works, that limitations we thought that were really somehow set in stone were not set in stone. And that's a wonderful thing too. The other improvement that we saw in the SF36 was in general uh, health, also had a really high, uh, high, a really high P factor. So it was very significant uh, in general health. So they felt that their health improved. Now, their actual measurements of health on their diabetes, on their COPD, uh, on all kinds of things that. Um, all kinds of things that uh, you know medicine would not normally see improved in six weeks. We didn't have any measurements for those, and I don't know that they would have improved in six weeks. Maybe some of them could have improved in six weeks. Um, but the general belief and feeling about how their health was going was much higher. And this SF36, by the way, is a highly respected uh, measurement used in healthcare uh, studies. We also did these qualitative measures through the post-intervention interviews, and we asked people questions like, if you compare your balance during functional activity that you have now to uh, before, that, that well, I'm sorry, that before, because of what it was like before you took the class, uh, what's your situation? Did it improve? And 90% of the people said that they improved. And the people had said before that yes, 50% of them said, I have some kind of balance problem, that something's not right for me. So people were able to come back with these incredible statements like, you know, not only did they have these statistically significant measurements, like in a step test, we did a physical step test where you step on and off a step, uh, put your foot on and off of the step or as many times as you can in 20 seconds, or the ability to turn 360 degrees was another one of our measurements that showed 
uh, a really good outcome. Not only did they have those kinds of improvements, but they felt their functional activity improve. They were able to report, and this was the most common reporting reported thing that they felt in, uh, was phenomenal, was getting up and down from the floor, their ability to get up and down from the floor. We also heard things around reaching, getting in and out of cabinets, being able to uh, climb a ladder to put in a light bulb. Then people were talking about their ability to think clearer, golf. They felt like they could find their posture, their alignment easier without having to think about it so much. So these were really, I think, phenomenal uh, aspects of what could happen and did happen for those in that Bones for Life class. So for us, um, Bones for Life and these 90 movement processes that cover this range, that cover this range of simple things like bouncing on heels, pum pum, pum pum, to actually being pushed and learning to recover your balance or setting up uh, stations in which you gradually learn how to fall with safety. So there's a, a range here that's quite significant, that's, that's, that's important. I was uh, teaching this last weekend and a rock climber said, hey, this is like rock climbing, you know? So yes, it is, it's like rock climbing. It is, it is like rock climbing, that's absolutely correct. So um, what seems like a, Mm, I think sometimes like simple, it turns out that, you know, the, the building blocks are what we want to improve. And when we improve these building blocks, then we're able to do anything else that comes after those building blocks are in their best possible position, even better, even better. That's, key is you can do things even better. Sometimes we try to improve a high level skill and the building block is not there. And so in a somatic approach like Bones for Life, we're really looking at the building blocks, the, the building blocks of movement. And one of the things that she's done so beautifully, Ruth Yolanda has done so beautifully, is she's incorporated this ability for the brain to recognize these building block patterns. The brain really, it doesn't really have a bunch of sophisticated patterns of movement that it's looking for. It's mostly a, a fairly set rope grouping. It's like learning an alphabet. But then once you learn the alphabet, you can create the words. And then once you create the words, you can create sentences. And once you create sentences, you can create paragraphs and songs. Well, the same thing is true once you really have these rolling, reaching, crawling, getting up and down from the floor, learning to uh, destabilize, restabilize every time you take a step, then you really have what you need in order to be able to decide what, what I want to do with this alphabet. I think I want to go out and be a runner. I think I want to be a rock climber. I think I want to be the best grandmother I can be, or the best grandfather I can be. Um, I want to be able to you know, sit at the computer and be more comfortable. These are all things that these building blocks can help with. So let's experiment. I don't see any questions popping up. So if you do have questions, be sure you pop them in here and I'll start trying to answer them. Let's uh, do another movement process, another experimentation. So I'm going to back up a little bit again. Second there to adjust. There you go. And let's, um, let's just turn to look towards one direction or the other. So you just decide which direction you want to turn and look and notice where you see and what your range of motion is like. So you turn one way and then you turn the other way and get a sense for you know, what feels easy, what feels not so easy, what, what moves, what doesn't move, okay? Now, um, do it maybe once or twice more and see if you can pick a side that you would like to improve, a side that you would like to improve. Okay, so you get clear about that. Now, I'm sitting way back in my chair, so I'm gonna come forward in the chair. 
and I suggest if you were sitting back in the chair, you come forward in the chair. I'm going to do the same thing and turn again to see to the one side and to the other. And just sitting forward in the chair, you may find that your range of motion has improved a little bit or something's a little easier. And I notice something is a little easier for me. But I'm also noticing that my right side has got some issues going on, and so I'm going to improve my right side. If you want to improve your right side, you're going to bring your right arm out in front of you. If you want to improve your left side, turning to the left, you're going to bring your left arm out in front of you. And so bring your right arm out in front of you, about shoulder height, and just reach. And then come back in that reaching. Reach and come back in that reaching. In fact, we're going to reach and we're going to bend the elbow and look at the hand. And reach, bend the elbow, look at the hand, and reach. Now, of course, when you reach, the shoulder blade is free to slide away from the spine. And when you quit reaching, it comes back to its resting position. You can also feel that the collarbone is moving. You can even put your hand there to feel how the collarbone is moving when you reach and you stop reaching. Good. Now pause for a moment. So you just rest your arm. Bring your hand, your other hand, to be on your ribs. So if you were improving your left arm, your right hand will be on your left ribs. If you're improving your right side of the neck, your left hand will be on the right ribs. And you're going to do the same movement. You're just going to reach and look at the hand and reach and look at the hand. And you're going to feel with your hand on the ribs What's the motion going on in the ribs? What is that motion that's going on in the ribs? So for me, the motion is as if, if this was my ribs, I feel like my ribs are doing this. I don't know if that's what you feel, but that's what I feel. Okay, now let's check and see if anything improved in the direction that you were working to improve. Oh, already. Yeah, I got, some diff I got some improvement. I hope you got some improvement already. Let's see if we can make it a little bit more. So bringing the same arm back out, put the hands on the ribs again. This time when you reach, you're going to rotate the entire shaft of the arm so that the thumb goes down. And then reach and reach and the entire shaft of the arm so the thumb goes down. So that means the shoulder blade, the scapula, is also moving behind and kind of flaring out. The bottom end is flaring out. And I noticed that I was starting to lean my head. I want to actually keep my head upright as I do the movement. And then feel under your hand on the ribs. What are the ribs doing now? Okay, and pause for a moment. And just in the pausing, you may feel something is changing. Somehow there's some kind of different sensation along the neck or in the shoulder. And then let's turn to see if that direction you were working to improve is any better. I'm liking that, yeah. Now the one I wanted to improve is better than the one that I thought was more functional. Now, what happened under these ribs, I don't know did, how you would describe that, but since I can't get feedback from you, I'm gonna say, so in, before, the first movement was more like this, but now the ribs feel like they're not only turning, rotating, but they're also flaring out and then coming back and flaring out and coming back and flaring out. So that means across the back of the spine, across the back of the spine, where the ribs connect into the vertebra, they're getting some space and some twist in that thoracic area, which is really vital, very important motion that needs to happen in the thoracic spine. <clears throat> Good. So we have an experience here using our arm as um, a handle to start to 
improve the thoracic spine. And this is extremely important because your neck has very few connections. It has very few connections. The bones of the neck are lay, um, stacked on top of each other, but it doesn't have a bunch of ribs coming around to hold them in place. Your lumbar spine does not have a bunch of ribs coming around to hold it in place, but this thoracic, which is supposed to be able to do all kinds of movement, has all these holdings, all these, these ribs that come from the back to the front to the breastbone that tend to start to limit the motion if we don't keep re-inviting it. And at least in the American culture, I know we have a lot of people here from other cultures, but I'm gonna say for the American culture, we don't move this very much. This is not something we move a lot. So then the neck starts to get much more vulnerable. The low back gets more vulnerable because if the middle spine is not moving in the way that it's meant to move, your body is smart and it will take up the motion somewhere else. It will get it where it can get it. And that's gonna be the neck and the back and eventually cause you some problems. So let's continue to use this work with the arm. And we're gonna change it up now, and you can choose your left or your right. I'm just gonna stay with my right. We're just gonna to start to slide, let the arm hang down by your side on the chair. Let the arm come onto your lap. And then let your arm kind of come up a little bit towards your mouth. So maybe it comes up to breastbone height, and the hand slides back down and off. Do this several times, just nice and easy. Think about your fingertips starting to orient towards your mouth. Sense of your elbow is tending to uh, lift. So a lot of times when people start to bring their hand up, their elbow starts to lift out to the side. We want to limit that. We want to just let the elbow hang down and come along for the ride as opposed to the upper arm trying to lift the hand towards the mouth. Gonna instead let the fingertips be the guide, and this time maybe your hands make it all the way up to the top of your breastbone. Your hand, not your hands, your hand. Each time the hand comes back off, it hangs in the air for a moment, and you come back to the movement. There's contact with the body. See if you can have your hand in contact with your body, up to your lips, up to your chin, your lips, your nose, and then sliding back down. to the nose, up to the forehead, sliding back down. Up to the belly, the chest, the chin, the forehead, coming up, sliding back down. Letting that contact with your body give a sense of safety and clarity. And then coming up, up, up. And if you're able, you go ahead and extend the arm up and you feel that it can open out. The this, this, uh, shoulder blade will slide back toward the spine. The armpit will open out. Your hand will wave against away from your body, will wave against from you, out away from you. Okay. And then you fold the arm back in, you slide the hand back down. So this is a really nice coming home into the shoulder joint movement can be used very well for a number of people to get their bodies back into the shoulder joints sort of back into home place. If for you it's painful anywhere along the line, we always say don't do anything that's painful. Stay within your easy, comfortable range. Use your imagination. Go slower, go smaller. Now let's try that with the other arm. So bring the arm up onto the lap and then let it fall off. The lap up the belly, the middle of the chest, falling off. Thinking about the fingers coming towards the mouth, attending to whether the elbow, the upper arm is working hard or if it can just follow the movement of the fingers. Each time you just go a little bit further up this midline. 
Now it could be some people have got things going on with coming right up the midline does not work for them and they need to go a little bit off to one side. So you're in charge of finding the trajectory that works for you. As we settle in and we do a little bit more, you might feel your breathing getting a little bit easier. Over the forehead. And now, if you're ready, go ahead and extend your arm out. So it's above you and you can feel the shaft of the arm starting to turn away from you so that your hand would be waving out to the outside as opposed to in towards the face would be away. Good. Okay, bring your hand back down and pause for a moment. Okay, I'm gonna just take a moment here just to double check, make sure everybody's doing good. As far as I can tell, everybody's fine. I don't see any questions. Okay, so let's take this into standing. So we'll Bring it up to standing. I'm gonna try not to get too far away. So you might have trouble hearing me if I get too far away. And yes, if you want feedback, you can come up to standing and let me see you. So thank you to the person who just turned their camera on. That's very helpful. So I know whether what I'm saying makes sense or not. So we're going to, we're gonna put these things of bouncing on heels together with our arms. And we're gonna see how it feels our sense changes our sense of our uprightness. So first, let's figure out, you know, how do we feel? Notice how your weight is on your feet. Does it feel distributed front to back? Feel like it's more in the heels? How about your knees? Do your knees feel locked in back or slightly bent? And you don't need to change anything. You just notice. Notice what the curve of your low back feels like. The curve of your neck. Tune into that. Does your head feel like it sits forward of your body, on top of your body, behind your body? Does your body feel forward of your pelvis, like your torso feel like it's somehow forward of your pelvis, on top of your pelvis, behind your pelvis? These are all things that we could pay attention to. Now we're gonna begin to slide this arm, you can choose whichever arm you want, up the midline and away from you. And see if you could attach it to the side of your head, okay? And if you can't, you, if you can't bring the arm in to touch the head, you could put your fist here, or you could put a towel roll here. Now if you get a towel, so that'll be a little bit hard to do. And then just bring the hand back down. We'll try it with the other arm, arm coming up. Again, the hand is away from the body, so when you turn the hand out and away, and then maybe it can be attached. Now, some people might only get to here, that will work. Just do what's in your easy, comfortable range. This is not hard for me right now, so I can do it, but if it were, and I would be quite happy with this, I'd even be happy with this, I could even be happy with this. There's a lot of options to get there. Okay, so we're feeling that coming back down. Now we're gonna look at the hand that's down. And the hand that's down, we're gonna bring back and attach somewhere onto the rear end. So we're gonna actually externally rotate the shoulder a little bit, and then we're gonna just like attach it behind us here a little bit. So if we have one hand going up and one hand going down, we've got the hand here against the head, we've got the other hand here against the rump. We stay right there in that position. We find an easy breath, and now we bounce on heels. Pum, 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 Last one. Bring your arm back in. Let it come back down. And just pause and wait for a moment.
We'd like to wait because things keep happening in the waiting. Things happen in the waiting. Now let's come to the other arm. Start to slide it up over your body as the other arm is going behind you and attaching itself to the pelvis. So now this hand that's in the air needs to be touching something, if at all possible. And the other hand is touching something. It's forming a bridge for the, for the vulnerable curves of the body. And then we're gonna hold them a little ways away from each other. Like we just put a tiny little bit of tension between the fingers going one direction and the other and we'll bounce on heels. Pum, 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 Bring your hand back in. Let it come down. And pause and wait for things to settle without wiggling yourself around, not changing your posture immediately. But things will settle on their own without you doing anything. If you don't hurry it, you'll feel changes continuing to happen. And now notice, how is your torso sitting on your pelvis, pelvis on your legs? How's your head sitting on your body, on your torso? It seems a little bit better aligned? Do you feel more erect or less? How's the weight in your feet? How are your arms hanging? And then you would take that for a little walk before we sit down again. Okay, I felt better. <laughs> I have to say this is like an odd environment to teach a class in where you really don't have any feedback from people, but, um, but it's kind of important if you're gonna show video around the world not to have pictures of people popping in and out. Oh good, thanks Lindsay, you feel great too? I'm glad to hear it. Um, hopefully Pat, you feel good too, that, that was, uh, Good experience for you. Um, it gets into liability issues if we've got your pictures popping up and down and we start showing it to everybody we didn't really have legal permission to, to share all that so it makes for a slightly different experience here. So these are examples of bite-sized pieces of the smaller aspects of Bones for Life uh, and I think ones that are reasonable to teach like this in an ongoing class. I, I find that uh, the, the work is extremely valuable, as I said, in working with people who are uh, in their 70s and 80s, but honestly, I've used it with young children. Um, so, and I have a couple of different Bones for Life teachers that are adapting the work with children. So there's a lot of potential there for how you can uh, adapt it to the group that you want to adapt it to. Just got a great interview that will be out on YouTube soon with Andrea Tutt, who is an educator, uh, theater director, uh, teaches theater uh, at Xavier University, also teaches Pilates and yoga, and, and now has Bones for Life. And she's talking about how she's using it with her kids. She's talking to her children, her actual children. She's talking about how she uses it as a runner, She's talking about how she's using it with actors, uh, both at these young actors that are going to, these would-be actors in college that are coming into her classes in quite a bit of pain, actually. Um, but also, she's, she's talking about how she's using the work to help actors get not only a better performance, but also to let go of the trauma that comes from inhabiting 
these difficult characters that they take on because you somatically really try, as an actor, you try to really somatically pick up these characteristics of people who are being uh, abused or who are depressed or who are abusers or violent or are mentally struggling or whatever. And of course, these are what makes some of the best acting, right? Or people who are tortured. <laughs> so they are, they, they need ways of coming out of that somatic experience. And she, she's finding it helpful in that way. So I think when you have a good work like NLP or Bones for Life, you find that, that the adaptability of it is just only limited by your own creativity and how you could use it is only limited by your own creativity. So I'm going to start wrapping up if there's no questions here. So uh, someone has posted, this has been great for me, major muscle trauma to neck and upper muscles in a car accident one year ago. Two months with a chiropractor uh, um, as mandated by insurance did not help much. This session today, oh my gosh, I'm going to get emotional. This session today has improved my range of motion and reduced the tension I feel in my neck. And I'll incorporate this into my daily activity plus look into bones for life. Thank you. Oh gosh, isn't that lovely? I'm so glad for you. And there, there's so much potential, so much potential. So good for you. So, any other comments, questions, thoughts? Give you a second here to write anything down that you might need to write down there. Okay, so the important thing for whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching this on replay is that you uh, think about what is it you want in your life. You remember Larry was asking you, can you imagine can you imagine? And that is so important. What is it you imagine? And then what are the steps you want to take to go towards that imagination? So there was a post, uh, I can't remember what the quote was, but he was talking about the difference between a dreamer and a visionary. And a dreamer is somebody who has a lot of dreams, but a visionary is one who sets out to make a difference in the world. And um, that can begin with your own life for sure. I think it needs to begin with our own lives, but I hope you will envision your expanding place in the world and the difference that you can make not only in your own life and in the lives of people around you. And if you feel Neuro Linguistics Programming or Bones for Life are ways that you can do that, I know it is a way that you could do that then be in touch very, very quickly. Thank you all so much. I appreciate your attention. Uh, whenever you're watching this, appreciate your attention. Uh, be well, be well.